It's Valentine's Day, a red day. I have a touch of red, so I'm still in tune with what today is. Good morning and welcome to Business Morning. I'm Imi John Mekwa and... Um, but I wonder how many Nigerians have Valentine at the top of their mind at this time with the cash crunch and a lot of Nigerians having to buy Naira. In some cases, it costs as much as 50% of what in an individual wants to take. Have you visited a bank recently? Uh, at the, the queues at the ATM, uh, some banks tell their customers that they don't have cash. So imagine a bank saying they do not have cash. Then where do you turn to as an individual? Where do you get the cash from? And then uh, some can give as much as 3,000 Naira to buy what exactly? What can you buy with 3,000 Naira? Well, uh, it's a general unpleasant um, experience at this time. You can share it with us at Business Morning on channels. Business Morning at channels tv.com. You can share your Naira experience with us and tell us uh, how it is. Uh, we still have those queues there. And now it seems even the supply is getting tighter. Talking about cash, uh, we still have those people um, out there trying to get their own money and in some cases having to pay for their own money. Uh, these are not very pleasant times in Nigeria. And the election is, is really getting close now, just about 11 days, and we'll be going out there to vote. I wonder how this will affect your choice of uh, the candidates, you know. I wonder how it will affect who you vote for. The realities that Nigerians have to face at this time in 2023. Well, in other news now, yesterday there was a meeting between the All Progressives Congress in Lagos State with representatives from the National Arm with the organized private sector. And uh, well, obviously, it is to convince them uh, to give APC the power to continue both in Abuja, the center, and in Lagos. And they had uh, the, the governor, the minister of works and housing. Uh, they had the director general of the budget office and uh, all meeting with the private sector to tell them what they've done so far, what is ahead, and what they can expect. Some members of the public and private sectors meet at the invitation of the All Progressive Congress, the ruling party in Lagos State, Call this some sort of campaign, and that may not be far from the plan. As the host, Governor Babajide Sonwolu's opening remarks is an expose of some of the plans of the administration if they are given a second term in office. Top on the list being the fourth mainland bridge. In our time, we will see the fourth mainland bridge. And, and the reason being that we've taken a very, very detailed time to take through um, concessionaires, you know, uh, funders, you know, and investors. And we've done that by first ensuring that we can do for them a viable, feasible, viability and feasibility study. All of these things are the things we promise. We promise an integrated urban mass transportation system where people can use either the rail infrastructure, the road infrastructure, or the waterways infrastructure. The high point of the meeting is a panel discussion moderated by the chairman of Titan Bank, Mr. Tunde Lemo. The panelists, all members of the APC at the national level, have come prepared to convince the business community in Lagos that the party should retain power both in the state and at the center. We can see Lagos State government regarding so many infrastructural renewal. That is what it seems to be. It's, it's just to accelerate development and boost economic growth, nothing more. And to benchmark ourselves, where are we in five years? Where do we want to be in 2030? The Director General of Budget Office, Mr. Ben Akabwezi, sees work ahead in the face of debt servicing versus revenue ratio. We are currently, as Nigeria, at about you know 13 percent of of GDP. Again, even the African average is about 22 uh, you know, percent, not to talk of, and on the continent of Africa, people like South Africa are about 30 percent, people like Morocco are about 40 percent. So if we are only at 13 percent, it is not a surprise that we are not able to, you know, to provide, you know, for our people. Even when you bring on the 
um, CBN Ways and Means, we will be at over 35 percent. So in aggregate, our, our debt is not. But the real issue is, we, you know, we don't have enough avenues to be able to service that that. You know, that debt. The Minister of Works and Housing, Mr. Babasunde Rajifashola, takes the message home by posing a straight question to the business community. Without roads and bridges, that produces without ports. So you talked about the Lekki Free Zone, the Lekki Port, all of those were initiatives started by the APC government in Lagos State for national prosperity. The new airports being expanded, runways being built and expanded, the foundations now for a resurgent economy have been laid in eight years. Half of the time, it took the opposition to ignore them. That is the choice before you. Do you want to go back to those who didn't attend to them? Or do you want to trust those who have started the job? It's a good move, speaking from the perspective of a representative of the business community, and it's opened the path for further conversations. It's not politics. Uh, they have been part of the engagement with Lagos State. So I don't work for Lagos State, but when I talk like this, I actually engage them afterwards. The invitees leave the venue with the responsibility to weigh the pros and cons presented by the APC and decide on who will get their vote come the 25th of February and the 11th of March, 2023. Keep you here for so long. Because... You're welcome back. It's commodities time. Oil prices fell on Tuesday after the United States government said it would release more crude from its strategic petroleum reserve as mandated by lawmakers counter to expectations from some traders that the release could be cancelled or delayed. Brent's crude features fell 43 cents to $86.18 a barrel, while U.S. crude features fell 71 cents to $79.43 a barrel. The United States Department of Energy said after the previous session ended, it would sell 26 million barrels of oil from the SPR, a release that would likely push the reserve to its lowest level since 1983. The DOE had considered cancelling the fiscal year 2023 sale after U.S. President Joe Biden's administration last year sold a record 180 million barrels from the reserve, but that would be required Congress to act to change the mandate. Well, traders will be looking for clues from Tuesday's crucial U.S. consumer price index, uh, which is expected later today and a u.s uh, consumer price index in the previous two months instead of falling as previously estimated had been up risking higher inflation readings let's delve into this and a whole lot more with uh, dr disola swani joining us from reading uh, reading in uh, the uk associate senior analyst with financial derivatives company thank you so much doctor for your time this morning good morning Ine. thank you for having me on the show Great. So, um, what's with the U.S. first, they were supposed to be stocking up because I remember at the peak of the war last year, they depleted their reserve, you know, when it was really, really expensive. And we we're expecting that they'll be stocking up at this time. Instead, we see them depleting more. What's going on? Um, I think uh, the reason is just scarcity in the, in the U.S. You know, oil prices, energy prices are up globally. So, and also that is affecting... Um, um, energy prices in the U.S. and that's also feeding into headline inflation. So as as you mentioned, and you know the the, the, the U.S. Fed is also trying to you know bring down inflation, which has been uh, at many years high, down to around uh, the long run expectation of around two percent from the current six point five percent. So like you mentioned, any we saw we are, we are seeing um, a drawdown again, further drawdown around 20, 26 million barrels are expected to be released from the strategic reserve. Um, as against you know a uh, uh, building up at this time of the year and uh, which is also which is you know contributing to 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 lower oil prices but in addition to that um there are also expectations that all eyes traders investors are looking forward to um us uh consumer price index numbers for january which will be released uh, later today the expectations that it will decline to around 6.2 percent uh, in january 
down from around 6.5 percent in December. But if the reading comes in um, higher than expect than higher than expected, then it may it may um, dampen the risk on sentiment that is in the global uh, financial market at this moment, and that could have uh, implications for oil prices because oil is also a risky asset. And if you know inflation numbers coming higher than expected, then we may we 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 we, we, we may see you know. People moving, uh, investors, traders moving away from risky assets to risk-free assets. In addition to that, we're also seeing um, um, a key export terminal in Turkey come back online after being uh, offline due to the uh, um, tragic uh, uh, earthquake we saw in Turkey and, and, and Syria last week. So these are the factors that, um, in it that are pushing oil prices down at this time. Yeah, so, you know, last week we were talking about Russia, the forecast that they will start cutting 500,000 from their output from next month. But it seems that the impact of that has quickly wavered. Have we, have we, are we done with that, 500,000 every month from Russia? Maybe, okay, maybe we won't really feel it because of the sanctions, you know, from the uh, pipe or seaborne uh, supply. I mean, in the background of all of this is what you said, Russia cutting their output. I mean, and the, the global economy has been preparing for this. And so the effect has kind of been blunted out. Also, we are seeing huge demand coming out from, 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 from China. In addition to that, and I think this is also part of why uh, the U.S. also is releasing, uh, is releasing oil from strategic reserve instead of building up to kind of dampen the effect of, you know, higher demand from China. But also uh, 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 um, the cuts, the cutting of um, the reduction in production and, out and exports coming out of Russia. Because again, this is going to feed into um, energy prices and going to feed into inflation. And this is coming at a time where the U.S., even the developed economies, are trying drastically, are trying everything to bring inflation to the um, <clears throat> to bring inflation down before inflation becomes sticky. So. If they keep uh, depleting their reserve, I'm talking of the United States now, what are the risks? Uh, at what point do you think they can now, you know, top up? Because, I mean, I, I think the process is the lowest since uh, how many years? So it, it's think, risky that they don't have anything to fall back on. I'm, and I'm wondering, maybe they see a time when there's going to be excess of oil and so they can now use that time to top up or something. No, in addition to all of this, in the, uh, the EIA, so we are seeing... Um, uh, seven of the biggest oil fields, U.S. shale oil fields in the U.S., increasing production or coming online um, in March, mid-March. So we are, we are there's that on the other side. This, you know, biggest, um, seven of the biggest oil fields, U.S. shale oil fields are coming online or increasing their production by mid-March. So it's kind of like like a balancing out at this point, uh, um, Ini. In all right, and then we have uh, gas also in the news. We see that uh, increasing. I remember, uh, I think just about a month ago, the uh, Europe had expected there to be a worse uh, coal than, than they had. And that's, you know, of course, showed in the price of gas. Now gas is up again. What's, what's driving it this time? I mean, gas prices have been quite volatile, to be honest. In the, and three big factors are driving. It's one, like you said, weather. So we are seeing the expectations of a harsh winter, but we are seeing, you know, warmer than expected winter. In his winter today, this is five degrees, which is like warm for, for, for this time of the year. So because of the, we see warmer than expected winter in much of Europe, that has kind of reduced the demand for heating, which has also reduced the demand for natural gas, because natural gas is typically used for heating. So that's on one hand. On the other hand, we are seeing because of um, lower demand for heating, lower demand for natural gas, we are seeing... Um, a build up in in gas stockpiles, gas in storage in in the EU. In a, at this time of the year, we are seeing uh, the, the the current gas in storage is around sixty five percent higher than what is usually obtained around this time of the year. And there are some expectations that by the end of the winter, gas uh, um, excess gas in storage will be around fifty percent. That's fifty percent higher than around that time of the year. So. One, uh, uh, we are seeing warmer, warmer winter. Two, we are seeing higher than expected or a build up in storage. Three, we are also seeing huge imports. We are still seeing huge imports coming from coming from North America and Middle East. So these factors together are why uh, um, gas prices are kind of volatile, but they have been trending downwards from the from the record highs we saw um, last year. And we expect it to continue. 
oh yeah, they're expected to continue. I mean, Sweden yesterday announced that you know the risk of you know, power outages and power rationing has been reduced to low. So there are also expectations that the worst is over, that you know winter is almost over. So the likelihood that we are going to have very, very bitter winter is, is really, really low. Coupled with the fact that we have huge storage um, across the EU, there's huge storage many, many times higher than what they are usually are around this time of the year. And we are still seeing huge imports from, from um, North America and the Middle East. Does it mean uh, Europe's hunt for gas is over? Because I know Europe was desperately looking for source, you know, because of, of course, what's going on with Russia and uh, winning off that. And then, of course, Africa was supposed to stand a chance, Nigeria inclusive, you know, to, you know, make some money out of that. But are, are they done? Do they have their partners now or is it still an ongoing search? I mean, it's still an ongoing search. Russia still supplies some gas to the EU. I mean, but it has come significantly down compared to the for the five percent it used to be before before the war. It has significantly reduced. But there's still there's still a, there's still a search for for new um, uh, um, gas partners. But right now, I, I think the EU has kind of out of the woods because. Because of you know this, the, the the amount of gas in storage is significantly higher than than we need at this time of the year, such that we are forecasting that by the end of the winter we we'll still even have enough for next winter. So that has kind of reduced the urgency. Obviously, the EU is still looking for partners, sustainable partners for gas, but the urgency, I think the urgency has kind of reduced. Yeah, you know what, thank God you mentioned that because I was like, they're out of the woods now until the next winter, but I, I guess they're also planning ahead. I, I mean, it would be nice for Nigeria to also hook up uh, I, I, we've heard a lot of announcements about infrastructure, a gas pipeline to go from Nigeria to, I think, Cameroon and end up in Spain and countries like that. It would really be nice. I know the election is a major distraction at this time. If Nigeria could, you know, pace up work on that and then, you know, make, make, make use of, of this platform at this time. Indeed, indeed. In it would be, it be, obviously, it would be better to, have to you know, trans, be able to transport uh, 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 gas pipelines from Nigeria all the way to Europe, but that's going to take huge amount of investments in infrastructure, and that's going to happen over like 5, 10, 15, 20 years. So it's, it's not it's not a quick fix. Ah, uh, that's all I just broke my heart now. <laughs> 5, 10, 15. Oh, don't worry, we'll make it faster at least in Nigeria. Well, let's look at uh, commodities now. What's going on there? We see the price of cocoa is up almost 2%, wheat also up. Uh, of course, that's to do with Russia. What's really going on around there? Okay, so for cocoa, it's it's kind of a mixed bag, right? So one, this is this is season of love, right? So it's Valentine's Day. <laughs> you had to bring that in. <laughs> I don't see your red, anyways. That is, I don't know where your red is. I have so, my red here. Where's try, yours? Trying to keep it professional. Trying to keep it professional. <laughs> 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 okay, so in the season of love, so we are seeing um, demand coming from uh, global demand and increase in global demand. But on the supply side, it's kind of mixed, right? So for for big exporters like like Ivory Coast in this 2022 2023 marketing year, we see a slight increase in production at, at, as at as at from October till around first of February. Uh, production exports from Ivory Coast. Came down, came up to around uh, 1.6 million uh, metric tons, which is up around 3.8 percent. But if you look at other countries like Nigeria, we we are, we are seeing kind of a sharp decline in in exports from Nigeria, at least for January, according to Cocoa Association of Nigeria, we saw a decline month on month of around 0.4 percent in cocoa, but year on year was significant, around 73 percent to around 35,000. A, a, a metric ton. So we are seeing that that mixed bag on the supply on the supply side. Also, we are seeing the onset of rains in in, in West Africa. You know, before now we had we had you know the the Hamatan season, which kind of dried out the roots of 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 you know cocoa and affected the quality. But with the onset of the rains, it is improving the expectation of the, of the outlook for the harvest, which is kind of dampening the prices. So these two these factors are, are what is are driving. Uh, what are driving our uh, cocoa prices at the moment? All regarding right. wheat, mm -hmm. go ahead, please. Re re regarding wheat, like you, like you um, alluded to, it's uh, it's basically Russia, right? We are seeing uh, um, an escalation over the past few days and past weeks. We saw some missiles 
missile attacks on Ukrainian cities, you know, which has which is raising concerns about you know an escalation in this Russia Ukraine war, which you know is going to affect is expected to affect um, the planting, the harvest, and the export of 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 wheat out of out of Ukraine and Russia. And this is particularly important because you know this Ukraine and Russia are one of the biggest and the biggest are some of the biggest uh, producers and exporters of wheat globally. And globally also wheat is kind of a staple commodity. So if you know there's an escalation in this in the in the Ukraine Russia conflict you know, and the prices of, of, of wheat increases globally, it has a far-reaching effect on the global economy. I mean, if you look at even Nigeria, we import most of the wheat. Many also, many African countries also import import most of the wheat they consume, which is a staple, and uh, which is, you know, used to make other staples. So I think it, it, it has, you know, far-reaching uh, far um, implications. In addition to that, uh, in the 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 black sea deal which is which essentially despite the fighting but despite the war between ukraine and russia allows ukraine to export ukraine to export you know some of its commodities through this black sea uh, 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 region the black sea deal is up for renewal in at uh, mid mid may no sorry mid march and you know the future of that is unknown so it is not it's not certain that you know russia is going to agree to continue the deal or whether the deal is going to continue at all so there's some of the factors that are affecting wheat prices um, at this moment. Yeah, well, that uh, deal is very important. And uh, we do hope, because both countries are actually, or the world generally, is actually benefiting from the deal. I remember before the deal, wheat was really expensive, couldn't get out of Ukraine. And, you know, the farmers there were suffering because everything was wasting and getting burnt and, and all of that. So we do hope that they can renew that deal and at least keep that part of the trade ongoing thank you so much and happy valentine's at isola i hope you <laughs> i hope you remember sometime in the evening to have a valentine moment and all of that but enjoy your day <laughs> have a lovely day you too all right let's take a break now when we come back remember that story we showed you at the beginning of the program where uh, all progressives congress met with the private sector organized private sector in lagos state will elaborate on that conversation right after this break <music> Welcome back. Well, yesterday afternoon, to be precise, it was a meeting between the All Progressives Congress and the private sector in Lagos. And uh, as we had seen the report earlier, we saw uh, some of the faces of APC uh, coming from Abuja to meet with Lagos and talking to the business people in Lagos to convince them that APC is still the way to go, uh, both in Lagos and at the national level well to help us drill down on some of those promises and their plans we have the honorable commissioner for economic planning and budget in lagos state mr samuel Gube, uh came into the studio thank you for stopping by thank you very much Amy. Yeah, my so, pleasure being here all the time <laughs> good to have you so i guess you would say it was a successful meeting yesterday but what did you tell those guys those business people are very difficult to convince what did you tell them what are you promising them well the business people know us in lagos they know the party they know the history of leadership that we have shown in lagos and they are the biggest partners of the development of lagos so basically we're meeting them they control significant amount of the economy. Uh, and so we're meeting them to tell them about the leverage which partnerships can bring, and that partnerships around which we have together developed Lagos. Um, we're talking to them and making commitments around what we thought leadership of Lagos should look like and the character of what a true leader of Lagos should look like. Because they feel the pinch, they have the experience, they manage their risks. And so it was an opportunity also to share uh, um, that perspective with them, but it was also an opportunity to talk about the progress that Lagos was making and the progress that Lagos and potentially the Federation can make if we have the right connection between the idea of the rising Lagos and the renewed hope agenda, uh, both at the center and as Lagos as a state. The whole idea of leverage that should come around if there's a proper connection uh, between the Lagos state operation and business 
these ideas and economic ideas and that that will be happening at the center. So it was an opportunity to parade some of the brightest and best out of Lagos. So yeah, that we, Lagos saw that. Will we saw that. We saw the Minister of Works. We saw uh, the DG of Budgets. I mean, just showing off, showing off your great arsenals. Well, it looks like the great arsenals from Lagos, but it's actually assets from for Nigeria. And those were people that were groomed out of Lagos, uh, people that we brought in from the private sector. So they were with their former colleagues and we're demonstrating also to the people that we can get more of that happen at the federal government position if we just make the right choices at this time. We showed them developments that have happened both at the federal level and at the Lagos level. And the great things that Lagos celebrate today being a partnership between um, Lagos having a direct congress with the manifest uh, presence of, of what was happening in the federal government positions. Yeah, well, uh, obviously you do have a great partnership because I, I think as the governor noted yesterday, about 70% of the headquarters of uh, corporates that are in Nigeria I reside in Lagos, I headquartered in Lagos, so you get a bunch of the tax. But you also have the huge responsibility, as we noted, some of them did talk about the issue of infrastructure. I know the governor talked about the, the plan to connect uh, the transport model, to make it intermodal, mm -hmm. so you have the water and all of that. But, I mean, businesses are feeling the pinch, as you, as you also noted. For instance, we had um, the uh, Dr. Bankoli from the Lagos mm -hmm. Business School who said, I mean, they spend about five hours in traffic. That is time that you cannot recover or pay for. You know, so it becomes a desperate need, you know, for it to be dealt with. And uh, I mean, I think the government is trying to develop Lagos as the Ekpe area and all of that so, as the new Lagos. So I will tell you, it's part of the idea around that progress is being made significantly and we need to focus on the progress that is being made, right, and make our choices based on those progress because you must press through the pain to get um, the, the great ideas that we're, we're, we're about. So if you look at the Ekpe Expressway, for example, we've turned that place to a six-lane highway reinforced concrete from Eleko all the way to Ekpe Junction, and we have now flagged off phase two from Eleko Junction to Ibrahim Ladesonia. We are commissioning the Fort Mainland Bridge, which will take out us out from um, Aja all the way to the um, Lagos Ibadan Expressway. So it's a lot of infrastructure that is going on. Um, that is the biggest corridor happening along that axis. Uh, we have a deep sea port, which is going to be like three times the capacity of our papa port, uh, and the economic activity that will that will present right we talked about the approval of the badagri um, on the west side the tending badagri road on the right on, on, the, on the west side and the blue line running through that artery, the red line, which is where, again, you see the partnership between Lagos um, and the federal government. It will be impossible to do the red line from Agbado all the way to Oyingo without a partnership. In fact, during the time of Fashola, that was what prevented it. Today, with that partnership, Lagos is able to save $384 billion and is able to deliver a brand new rail, the red line, all the way. And it will cut down journey time from two and a half hours to 30 minutes, increasing the productivity of our people. It's also also in that line, the integrated transport master plan is being um, deployed. Um, we are delivering on the on the ferries, on the waterways. We are creating 18 new jetties, seven of which have been completed. Channels on the waterways and integrating all of that with our bus rapid transport corridors, our quality corridors, our last mile buses and heavy capacity buses. All of these play together to ameliorate what Bankole was talking about. With the regional road increasing the capacity of the Lekke Express, we are running parallel to it, um, just becomes a game changer. But again, you must see that it is happening because of the caliber uh, of leadership that we have in Lagos, which we believe should also go to the federal government. We, we are looking at, uh, around young people that are in cabinet in Lagos, running the parastella. We're looking at the inclusion of women um, driving some of our, infra our biggest infrastructure. The rail uh, MD is, is a woman in charge of Lamata. It's a woman also driving uh, works and infrastructure. Politicians, they never, so miss, it's, a it's, it's, they it's, never it's, miss a chance to push it out there. And it's, it's to say that leadership requires a lot of inclusion, and Lagos is master of it. <laughs> and that is the opportunity that we're discussing yesterday. And the private sector wants that that goes into the federal position. <laughs> 
and let there be <laughs> active integration between the private sector in Lagos and the Federation. And Commissioner, let them you have themselves. done a very good work, but <laughs> <laughs> let me also bring another Tell concern. Me. Uh, Mrs. Taiwo Taiwo talked about yes, the issue please. of maintenance. Okay. So uh, if we look around in Nigeria, we celebrate a lot of things when they start, but down the line, a couple of years down the line, we don't see them anymore because they seem that we do not pay attention to maintenance. What's the maintenance plan? The blue, the blue rail that the president came to commission, uh, we're expecting, of course, the second phase that will lead to a Kokomaiko. I mean, the, uh, all the beautiful ideas. You've talked about the Fort Milan Bridge. We're, going, we're, going, we're, we're watching you guys. The governor said, at least before... As in, for the second term, I believe. I mean, we'll, we'll see it, we'll, we'll see it <laughs> progress significantly. Because it's been a long-term dream. So maintenance is, a very, exactly, is maintenance. a very interesting component of the plan. So when you see the Lekki Deep Sea Port going into operation, it is private sector led, which is why this partnership is significant, which is why in Lagos we say Ajimoshi when we say Igbega Igbile Eko, right? It is a collective work and we're doing that really well. So you see CMA of France leading the, 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 the arsenal in terms of world class operators of that port, um, the amount of equipment and capacity we've put there that qualifies it to be able to run three times the capacity of a papa shows that the partnership between the private sector um, and government is working. When we talk about the Niger Bridge, again, it is the uh, sovereign wealth fund working around investments, right, that is making that um, work. So that partnership works. We're talking about concessions, right? Um, we're talking about the blue line the red line, they will eventually go into concessions. Um, you talk about even our strategy in ensuring that equipping the healthcare systems in Lagos work is a partnership. The private sector are very well grounded in ensuring that the investments of their assets continue to run. In the feds, you find out that they've not, the, the, the finance, uh, Ministry of Finance Incorporated has been activated with a governing council and we'll put all our assets there and active asset management is part of what uh, speaks to maintenance longevity. So we are on course, right, um, with the maintenance idea um, being at the forefront. And of course, um, you need great minds. You need people who have learned and have been trained around this whole idea of maintenance, right, that are coming into play. So in terms of leadership, it's not just one leader. It's the aggregation of leading lights that that leader is able to produce that we intend to birth for the Federation and assure that that maintenance culture um, that is growing in Lagos and you see in Lagos rising will begin to get into the culture in the Federation mm. and, and across the country as well. I'm just curious, is it part of when you sign agreement at the beginning um, with this private sector, do you also include the clause that takes care of the maintenance of it. There are very clear service level agreements that we arrive at in the concession agreements. Um, there are clear um, parameters that must be met by the private sector when they come in. And apart from those parameters, it's also inherent in the private sector that to reduce the amount of investment in repair work, you must ensure your maintenance culture is on point. Otherwise, when the calamity comes, you will spend probably 10 times the amount. So it is in the private sector naturally um, to keep maintaining so that their efficiency at which they run is sustained throughout the life of the assets. Mm. So all of that are tied in in the concession agreements um, that we're entering into and will continue um, yeah, to, to that's very, That's very interesting and very necessary because it's been a weak point for Nigeria. Now, uh, the final thing I'd like to ask you, Mr. Egbe, is We've had a lot of jackpa, and that has affected us in reality. Some of the failed transactions we have on our financial banks and all of that is because the personnel, you know, that used to handle it have looked for greener pastures. Uh, they, of course, they want more comforts or a system is more predictable and all of that. But how do we recover from it, at least in Lagos State? So in Lagos, right, we... We are acquainted with the whole idea of Jakpa. The first thing that happens is that Nigerians Jakpa into Lagos.
That's their first point. <laughs> and they do so because of the differential benefit and differential um, um, increase in infrastructure stock that you, you find in Lagos. I, I think the idea is that, like was said yesterday, uh, people jackparry are not jackparring because of the food. They are not jackparring because of the climate or the temperature, right? But because of the infrastructure. So you see what um, um, His Excellency Mr. Fashulak account he gave. We've increased the stock federally of infrastructure from 20% of, of, of GDP of the country to about 35%, right? And so we're moving on. And all the things that Mr. Governor talked about, um, the rail, the deep sea port, the media city, the food security and logistic base, you know, and all of those infrastructure, 950 to 1,000 road infrastructure, what we're doing in education, right? You can't stop people from going, but you can make it difficult, um, a choice for them to make once your infrastructure situation continues um, to improve. Uh, we build houses for our doctors. We pay for their examination fees, right, to become professionals. And, and we do all of that in Lagos. It's the reason why when there's a strike nationally in our tertiary institutions, these tertiary institutions for Lagos are not on strike, right? It's the reason why in our WAEC we're seeing an improvement in the pass rate, including math and English, from about 31% to 80%, and it's repeated itself again, right? And, and that's all that we're doing to just encourage and ensure um, the system works. So as we grow the environment, we launch the rice meal, it creates opportunities for 250,000 people. We complete the deep sea port. It creates opportunity for 170,000 people. All of those things begin to encourage and reduce the burden on families and will make them stay. I talk to some of those that have jackpot and they always want to come back to Lagos for Christmas. They want to come <laughs> back to be happy um, and to enjoy themselves. Uh -huh. uh, so it's, it's something that we must collaborate. So we have a very active diaspora network also that we engage because as they go abroad and they expose themselves to new technology, new ways and fresh international capital, we need those capital to come back. Don't forget that diaspora remittances also contribute significantly to the revenues or the inflows that come into development of our country. So we need everything to work together. Right? And so by acknowledging all that we have, the opportunities and the progress we're making, we make the correct decisions and we move our country forward. All right. That so was what yesterday was about. How often do you have this talk or is it just towards the election? So Lagos State is home for the organized private sector. <laughs> we meet them every time. They, were, they participated very actively in COVID. You saw that if it's for COVID only, you should elect the governor back. But he did not do it alone. He did it working together with the private sector. So we are constantly in touch. At Higbeti, we work together with the private sector, and it's a continuous play between us and the private sector. When we say Lagos is great, it's that partnership that makes it great. And so if we'll continue to hold it uh, virtually. These are big stakeholders. They control a large size of employment stock in Lagos. And once they believe in us as they have believed now, we believe their people will also see reason. Uh, All right, uh, Mr. Sam Igube, uh, the Commissioner for Economic Planning and Budget in Lagos State. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, well, we'll see the results of this, of your meetings and your conversations at the polls. We're seeing it already. <laughs> We're feeling it already. We're okay. thankful for the support of the people of Lagos and for the people of Nigeria in looking correctly in the right direction. And as we say it, Follow who no road. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much for coming thank on the you, show. Thank you, thank you, <laughs> All right, so that was uh, the Honorable Commissioner for Economic Planning and Budget in Lagos uh, joining us to, you know, elaborate on that meeting they had yesterday with the private sector and uh, some of the high points of that. Now, um, let's move over to a market now, starting our market journey, beginning with... Uh, money markets in Nigeria and uh, well I don't have to do this today Anita is here to take us through uh, what happened and it is good morning, morning. I, I see it was a green equities market uh, yeah. for Monday good news a at least the start. recovery from the last three days of last week yeah well, you know, uh, profit taking had ensued um, three, in three sessions last week. Yeah. But at the same time, the market also managed to close the week in the positive terrain. That's due to Dangote cement and then some other... Some powerful uh, stocks. Exactly. There. What you call the bellwether stocks or the mm. most capitalized um, stocks. Mm. So now this time, it's another bullish start, 0.07%, which we'll be showing. And then, of course, we'll also tell you 
um, the, the components that uh, drove the market uh, for the start of the third uh, week of uh, February. So now, our market, the equities market, the barometer of uh, the economy, of any economy around the world, it was up by 0.07%, and that's thanks to 18 gainers, largely uh, the likes of Lafarge, Access Bank, Zenith, MRS, Corn Oil. They were the ones that really drove the market, propelling it further into the 54,000 level, and then we're halfway, almost will be soon be counting up to the 55,000 level, which is about some 14 year high. In terms of valuation, the Naira valuation, the market gained 20.35 billion Naira, which is what you see here. And then for the market cap, the, the market's total value, 29.61 trillion Naira. That's what the market, our local stock market, is worth at the moment in Naira uh, terms. Now let's take a look at the uh, sectoral performances. All green arrows there, green color, green positive. Now that's that's because the likes of, as I mentioned earlier, the likes of Access Bank, Zenith, and some other tier two lenders in that sector were the ones that drove the market up by more than half of a percent. Now, take a look at the oil and gas sector, the likes of MRS, the likes of Corn Oil, lifted that market. Corn Oil, which was the top gainer yesterday, it went up by 10%. And then, of course, it also countered the losses that were recorded by CWG, which went down by 9.2%. So that's it for the sectoral performance. Now, take a look at the activity chart. It was, a, uh, well, it was in the green for, for, for that market. The sector, the sector, it was up by uh, more than, more than, 20 percent, uh, if I if I if I if I recall. So, and for the day, UBA was a most traded stock by volume. It it contributed about 20.32 uh, percent, and and that's at about some 28.62 million units. While Dangote Cement was the mid most traded stock by value with 25.73 percent contribution at 812.89 million naira. Now let's move over to the unlisted securities market. For the securities, for the unlisted securities market at the NESD, it was on the upside, up by 0.07%. Let's move over. So now we will be going back to the unlisted securities market. But first, let's talk about the fixed income market. Yesterday we had a FGN bond auction carried out, and of course investors' eyes were there. Now to give us more information about how that sub the the subscription level there and what to expect in Wednesday. Let's talk to Caleb Alimi, is a chief dealer at Providence Bank. Thank you for joining us, Caleb. Thank you, Anita. Good morning. Okay, so now this is the morning after we we had the FGM bond auction, which investors had their eyes on it, and at the same time we will we'll be expecting the inflation data due to be released by the National Bureau of Statistics tomorrow. So now first, let's start with the bond auction yesterday. Give us more information about it. Okay, thank you. Um, yesterday, the DMO offered a total of $360 billion across four maturities, um, uh, a five-year paper uh, all the way to a 20-year paper, 20, from 2020 to 2049. They offered $360 billion. Subscription level was about three times that size. Subscription level was total of over 993 billion, and DMO took advantage of that and sold a total of 770 billion at the maximum rate of 16 percent. At the two short dated papers, short to mid dated papers, 2028 and 2032, we saw that um, interest rates remain the same, stop rates remain the same from the previous auction. However, at the you know 2037 and the 2049, which are the longer dated papers. Interest rates inched up just about 10 basis points on each of them to close at 15.9 and 16% respectively. And we expect that, you know, we will see that in the last two months, the DMR has raised over 1.4 trillion from, you know, just bonds. And we think that market is at this time really, really loaded. And we, we expect that rates will probably inch up around now, given that the liquidity from the market has also sort of inned out. Okay, uh, Caleb, um, according to what I have here, um, my analysis, the bonds market, as well as the treasury bills market, they were all bullish. Now, tomorrow we will be expecting the uh, January inflation data and uh, the, for December inflation at the tapered down. So now, what do you expect if the inflation data comes in higher, according to economic, uh, economic analysts, what should we expect for the market in Wednesday's trading session? You know, the market has already made peace with the fact that we cannot get, you know, interest rates above inflation. 
right? There's no positive return. So typically what's available are the options that are available to you. You already have the one year treasury bill, which closed at 2.27 at the last auction. At the last auction, you know, trading as very, very far from inflation. We won't see that carry into investors' mindset in the fixed income market where they will demand higher rates because of it. It will be largely driven by availability of securities and availability of liquidity. Yes. Hmm. Okay. All right. So we'll keep our eyes on the markets. And, and of course, we'll be uh, telling you how the inflation numbers roll in. So that was Caleb Alimi, chief dealer at Providence Bank, uh, giving us details about the fixed income markets. So now let's, uh, we, before we wrap, wrap it up, for the unlisted securities market, which we talked about, it was up against the previous loss of 0.50%. And the index, although it's on the downside, but it was positive for the day. And then, of course, the NID market capitalization has dropped all the way from the 1 trillion level to just about uh, still going down, almost below the 900 billion Naira level. In terms of the volume of transactions carried out, it was up by more than 17,000% in contrast to what you had as a Friday at 800.1 million Naira uh, uh, volume. Value was at 86.47% while deals there, just nine. Now let's move over to the advancer. We had only one advancer, which was why the market went up, UBM properties. And so that's it for that market. It was also the most uh, traded security on the NSD as at Monday. So that's it in the, for the market. Yeah, thank you so much. That's, uh, yeah. We're looking forward uh, to that uh, inflation number and see how investors will react to it. Yeah. Thank you. All right, and so Anita hands over to uh, the crypto man, uh, Laddie, and tells us <laughs> if, uh, the, Happy if the Valentine. <laughs> oh, jeez. Yeah. Are we celebrating Valentine? Well, the, the, the market is following the color. Of, oh, you know, Valentine's that's just an red. excuse. Your market has been no, doing. That's the color. We, we, it has to follow the <laughs> your color. Your market, your market has been in the red for how many months yeah, now? Yeah, and so? the investors are not following. You know, the reason for the season. You know, which is love <laughs> for these assets. So it's just the color. It's just the color. Today. Yeah. That's uh, okay. I agree with you, Ladi. You're right. You accept that. <laughs> All right. And you get your Valentine gift. Uh, ah, yes. I'm looking forward. <laughs> you see the sentiment here now. Neutral. Running away from uh, greed at this point. Trying to edge towards uh, fear the way the market is looking uh, right now with all of that FUD. You know, we're seeing with uh, BUSD and uh, all the drama uh, with the SEC in the U.S. hammering on stable coins. So we're seeing the effect of that. Investors are trying to sell off what they can at this point. Let's look at the uh, market cap. One trillion on the verge of, of going below one trillion at this point, down 1.19%. And we see the uh, volume also down this morning. Bitcoin dominance in at 41.83%. Let's look at the price of Bitcoin uh, quickly now. We see Bitcoin trying to hold on. It's uh, lost a lot of support, you know, at this time with the sell-offs you see in the market. We see Bitcoin holding on at $21,766. Uh, it's down about 0.38% with volume traded $22.92 billion. And we see Ethereum there also losing that $1,600 mark. It's down 1.01%. We see right behind me there, $1,504. Uh, wondering if 1.5 is going to hold uh, going forward, we're still expecting that CPI data in the U.S. So that also, you know, has a part of playing this market. Volume traded 8.79 uh, billion dollars. Uh, let's bring in success, Chibike now, uh, CEO uh, by Sussy App. Uh, great to have you. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. So it's still about the uh, the SEC uh, in the U.S. still hounding. You know, those uh, stable coins, they're still on that BUSD uh, matter there. They did give that uh, news yesterday that uh, the, the PACs should stop, you know, minting the BUSD uh, tokens at this point. So how is the market, uh, how investors reacting to all of this? It looks like it's a crackdown on stable coins, the way it's looking. Well, it is certainly possible that we may see further regulatory actions targeting uh, stable coins in the future. But however, it is difficult to say how this will likely impact the crypto markets. Why some financial bodies may see stable coins as a threat to financial stability, I view them as a tool to facilitating crypto transactions. As for the question, if uh, the exchanges will be fully Bitcoin dominated. I think that is unlikely to happen. 
there are so many cryptocurrencies traded on the exchanges and they see a lot of demands for stable coins despite the regulatory actions so why we may see some changes in stable coins and how they are used i don't think we'll see a complete shift from them or towards bitcoin exclusively however it is worth to know that stable coins are just a bsd is just one of the stable coins in the markets and there are still many options available for those who want to use other stable coins but, but I think we did see a BUSD depeg from the dollar for a moment there yesterday with when that news uh, came out. What do you see going forward for BUSD? Well, um, Passos, which is the company that issues and redeems BUSD, uh, was warned yesterday by 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 the New York uh, Department for Finances Services. So I think I expect uh, CZ and the team to handle this. There's no need to panic. And the price just depends on fortunes in the short term way. But fundamentally, uh, from my view, from my view, uh, CZ does not use uh, collateral and does not use leverage in his business. So we are likely not to witness similar outcome uh, with the FCS saga. So, uh, if this port could not dump uh, BTC below 1,400, it is a good sign in the short term. I think this is just like a test, telling us uh, that the price could bounce hard after the fold goes off. Although this is not a financial advice, but this is what I told uh, our subscribers in, by sourcing. All right, thank so, you so much. Uh, we'll keep uh, watching and see how it all unfolds. Right now, it's all about regulation. In, in 2023. Thank you so much, uh, Success GBK founder by Saucy App. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right, let's uh, look at the top odds by market cap. We see it's all red on that counter with BNB there, the biggest down, uh, down 6.93%. So, in either way it's looking, it's still unfolding with this whole BUSD stablecoin issue. But uh, uh, all I'm seeing right now is regulation. You know, for yeah, I, I, I think we noted that at that. the beginning of the year it's yeah. going to be a year of regulation. regulation uh, in, in, in Nigeria, I, I think the election is is uh, taking attention now. But oh, yes. because remember, it is in the 2022 finance bill. Exactly. You understand? Know, so, it's supposed some, some to be going to get taxed. <laughs> <laughs> so it's regulation everywhere. But we'll see. We'll see how it goes at the exactly. end of the day. Thank you so much. Glad right. to see you at uh, one thirty. Thank you. So that's it on the program Business Morning today. It's uh, Valentine's Day, so uh, yes, you have all those cues and a few cues seems to be reducing, uh, but we still have those at the ATM. And, um, well, let's make the most of it. Enjoy Valentine. Show love one way or the other. I'm Mini John McCall. I'll see you tomorrow.